Jaime Permuth is a Guatemalan photographer living in New York um, and living and working in New York. Jaime received his uh, BA from Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He is a graduate of uh, the MFA in photography, video, and related media program here at SVA. And as a point of full disclosure, Jaime is also a distinguished alumnus of the Master of Professional Studies in Digital Photography program. Uh, actually, as a point of even more full disclosure, his fiance is also an, al an alumna of the program as well. Uh, his photographs uh, have been shown here in New York at the Museum of Modern Art, the Queens Museum of Art, the Brooklyn Museum of the Arts, the Museum of the City of New York, the Buish Jewish Museum, El uh, Museo de Barrio, and the Brooklyn Museum of Art. He's also exhibited internationally at the, why am I nervous, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> he puts up such a good standard, I can't take it. Wish. So, um, he's also ex exhibited Museo uh, Nacional de Arte de Moderno in um, Guatemala, the Casa de Logo in Mexico City, the Israeli Parliament, and just this past month in a solo exhibition at the, oh, I had it for a moment there. Rugajon. The Rugajon Gallery in Seoul, Seoul South Korea. Uh, in 2012, uh, Jaime was nominated for the San Santa Fe Prize in photography and was also one of 15 artists in the United States nominated for the Smithsonian American Art Museum's uh, Contemporary Artist Award. His work is included in collections of the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Museum of the City of New York, Yeshiva University Museum, the State University of New York in New Paltz, the Art Museum of Americas, the uh, Fullerton Art Museum, and the Museum of Art um, in Fort, Fort Lauderdale. He's received commissions from the uh, Museo uh, del Barrio, the Queen's Museum of Art, the Jewish Museum, and the Queen's Theater in the Park. His work has been published in, um, is this right? Is it in Enfoco? Uh, yeah. Yeah, in, in, in Enfoco Info magazine. Info Nova Luz. Nova Luz, uh, the Los Angeles Times, New York Post, the Jewish uh, Week, the New York Times, and most recently, uh, his uh, this year, he pub uh, his first monograph, Yonkeros, was published, and which is, of course, what we're going to hear about more tonight. Mm -hmm. um, on top of all that, Jaime is a faculty member here at the School of Visual Arts and in our Master's of uh, Professional Studies in Digital Photography program. And he's, of course, as you most, most of you know him, as the regular host and curator of our I3 lecture series. So I'm very honored to be introducing Jaime Permuth, my friend and colleague. Oh, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Tom. Um, thank you, Tom, for that really nice introduction. Uh, I'm sorry about the multiple languages required. And, uh, and welcome, everybody. Um, I'm really happy to be here presenting. I uh, appreciate the invitation from Tom and Katrine. Um, as Tom mentioned, um, I just came back from Seoul, Korea. Uh, from a solo show at Rugajon Gallery for Yonqueros. Um, I'm, I'm trying to wrap up the project this year. It's my fourth year uh, working on Yonqueros. <coughs> and I think it's time, uh, you know, to move on to the next thing. It's been a really wild, wild ride. Um, so I will limit uh, this presentation to Yonqueros. Uh, to my most recent project and not only show you some of the work but also hopefully have a conversation uh, and do feel free to interrupt me at any point if you want to ask a question raise your hand a microphone will come to you um, yeah so I'd like to talk about the images I talk I'd like to talk about the process of raising money for a book I'd like to talk about the process of publishing a book, designing it, and uh, you know, hopefully that's a, a conversation that can benefit everybody in this room. Um, so this is a map of Willets Point, Queens. It's also known as the Iron Triangle. It's very easy to see why. Um, on one side of Willets Point is the old Shea Stadium, which was uh, renovated and is now City Field Stadium. Across the water is La Guardia, 
And actually, Willets Point is right on the landing path for the airplanes that come into LaGuardia. So you'll see a bunch of that in the images. Um, this is what the place looks like, actually taken from the train. Over here on the left side is the stadium. So you, you can see it's right across the street from the junkyards. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background information um, about Willits Point so that you know some of the context for this work. There's over 250 businesses, some, some people put it at 300, uh, that specialize in uh, scrap metal and um, car parts. Uh, it's interesting that over 40% of them have been in operation for 30 years or more. So it's, it's not something new, it's something with a tradition of its own. Um, it's a contested land. New York City and Willits Point have been at odds for just about four decades, uh, with the city wanting desperately uh, for the junkyards to go away. Um, this has recently been finalized. Uh, New York City secured the necessary permits to redevelop Willits Point, so uh, that struggle has um, proved to be a loss for the mechanics. And uh, the majority of the mechanics and business owners, they come from Latin America, uh, particularly Mexico and Ecuador. But not only, there's also a small number of uh, mechanics who are Arabic, there's a number of them who are Italian, and there is even a, a small sector of uh, mechanics from Korea. Um, they each have different styles. Um, I concentrated on the Latin Americans, and that's because I myself am Latin American, and in, in throughout my career, I've been interested in hybrid identities and the way that um, these things play out for me in particular. So I, I tend to start from my own cultural background. So I concentrated on the Latin Americans. Um, the, the crux of this um, struggle, the, the reason why Willits Point has to go away, is that uh, City Field Stadium was renovated at a cost of almost a billion dollars. So um, you can imagine why the city feels an urge to redevelop the land and turn it into something that is better suited to that investment. Um, so after the, the stadium was renovated, the city redoubled its efforts in the fight against Willits Point. By February of 2011, um, nine business owners received notice from the city of their impending eviction. And in 2012, um, the city of New York was able to secure federal funding uh, to build an on and off ramp to the expressway. That was, legally, that was the obstacle that they needed to overcome, and financially as well, because it's not cheap <laughs> to build it. So. Um, I'd like to talk about the word itself. The word uh, yonqueros is uh, a derivation or a corruption of the English word junk, but sounded in a more friendly manner to a Latin ear as yonk. Then, oddly enough, it's, it's conjugated very elegantly and correctly, so that yonquero is uh, the person or business that works with junk, and el yonque is the place um, where such businesses are to be found. Um, I love the music in the syllables of the word. Um, it has uh, these kind of vaguely epic overtones, um, as if it uh, strives to, I don't know, attach itself or conjure some obscure and unsung uh, Greek hero uh, that nobody knows about. Uh, but I also think that it's um, irregular pedigree encapsulates something essential about the immigrant story uh, that is something that begins outside of the normative, uh, maybe in an unorthodox way, 
uh, nevertheless will strive to adapt and reconcile itself to the established order. And at the same time, creating something new in the process. Um, arriving in Willits Point the first day was uh, an extremely disorienting experience. It was very surreal uh, to come to the junkyards. And uh, part of me felt like I had opened my eyes inside a Walker Evans photograph from the Great Depression. And so I saw the landscape um, as a black and white landscape immediately. And it felt like something from the Dust Bowl, um, I don't know, Kansas, 1930s. And this is something that I kept in mind while I was doing the work. It helped me conceptualize the project. It helped me maybe uh, meditate a little bit deeper about the current economic crisis in the light of the Great Depression and what had changed in the interim. Who were the new migrant workers? How far had we come <coughs> from this period and th that time period? Um, so I'll show you some images. This is the first image in the book. And um, it's a particularly important image, so I'll just say a few things about it. As you know, uh, when you edit your work, uh, the opening image is all important. You, um, I, won't, I won't say you, I'll say I, uh, because I'm, I'm very much a literature person. And I'm interested in some of these devices that come from literature as applied to photography and also cinema. Um, so I think I, I tend to structure my work in terms of themes, recurrent ideas that come <coughs> back in the photographic work. So I always try to introduce some of these things right away. So the viewer, whoever he or she may be, uh, will we'll find a better sense of orientation when they come into my work. Here, um, what you see all the way in the background are the bleachers for the stadium. The foreground is uh, the main street in Willits Point, Willits Point Avenue, also known as the road to nowhere by the locals. Um, looking at this image, I remember very clearly uh, feeling that Willits Point was like a, a lunar kind of landscape, these uh, giant puddles. Um, they fill up with rainwater and also with sewage. Uh, the city of New York has neglected Willits Point for over four decades, so no sidewalks, no sewage, no police presence at night, um, and that's th why it looks the way it looks. So. The reflection um, is one of the one of the important aspects of this image. In in Spanish, we have a wonderful word called espejismo, which comes from espejo, which is mirror. Espejismo also means uh, mirage or hallucination. So this reflecting um, makes me think of that, of a hallucination, of something that is. Uh, challenging to your perception, to your sense of how things normally are. In the middle ground, there is the Pepsi Cola sign. That, uh, to me, had a kind of poetic quality because it doesn't read correctly from left to right. It's reversed. The reason for that is that it's meant for the paying audience at the stadium and not for the migrants. So in a sense, it articulates a division already in this image. Uh, furthermore, the, the, the typeface of the sign is not a 21st century Pepsi Cola. It's more like a vintage um, American dream from the 1930s kind of feeling that I get looking at it. So those are, those are some of the, the elements that are already there right off the bat. That's one of the um, 
the famous images from the series, the, the ones that has been reproduced the most. Um, it's a very simple moment. It's a mechanic from Uruguay, and that's the reason why he drinks mate. I don't know if anybody likes mate or, or know what, it, what it's about. It's a very bitter kind of tea, popular in South America. So he starts the day drinking mate. And um, this may be one of my favorite people in Willits Point, but not one of the power brokers. So right away when you do documentary work, part of your job is to figure out how you're going to get access and who's going to allow you uh, to do the work that you want to do. Um, this is not one of those guys. I still love the image though. And a, a friend of mine from Guatemala who uh, works in human rights and has seen everything and has endured everything there is to endure, uh, looked at this image and he asked me a question that really surprised me. He said to me, what does this guy have to smile about? Why is he happy? And, and it made me think, and I remember the day that I took the picture and how it was a summer day in a kind of summer weather like we're enjoying this week. Sticky, humid, miserable. Um, but it, it was still early enough in the morning that you didn't feel that. And so this guy had a window of maybe 15, 20 minutes in which to enjoy this drink, this mate, think about his traditions before the clients come in. Um, I also think there is something about having a body that is that powerful and feeling uh, so confident in yourself that comes across. So those are some of the reasons. Uh, this is from the first day of shooting. I, uh, one of the reasons why I fell in love with Willits Point were these uh, cars in the sky that were very strange to look at and just seemed to be floating. Uh, of course, beyond the, you know, the barrier, there are other cars and that's, it's stacked up on other cars just like it. Uh, each of them is damaged a different way and each of them tells um, a variation of a story, uh, you know, a personal story. As I mentioned, um, Willits Point is right on the, on the landing uh, trail for, for the airplanes descending into LaGuardia. Uh, so inevitably, whether I want it or not, there's airplanes in many, many of my images. Um, what do you do with them? How do you incorporate them visually? Well, I, I like this picture. I enjoy this picture because the airplane seems to be sliding down on the wire, which is not something that airplanes do unless they're toy airplanes. And, and the scale of it and, and everything kind of works that way. Um, for me, the beauty of it is, is that it also starts pointing at another one of the themes that interests me, which is the enormous distance between the ground and the sky in Willits Point, and you feel it very, very strongly. There is an aesthetic tension there um, that, that one needs to come to grips with. If you're a mechanic, um, there's a kind of interruption constantly by the airplanes coming down. It's noise, it's visual, and they pay attention. And somewhere in the back of their mind, I think, they might be thinking about their <coughs> homeland or about maybe the possibility that somebody from their country is visiting New York. There is some kind of mental thread tying it up. And again, um, I'm trying to emphasize the kind of surreal quality of Willits Point and, and that's why this composition works for me. Uh, this man is one of the power brokers. He doesn't look like it. He drives around in a decrepit, white van, um, but he has uh, five different shops all in the same corner of Willits Point. He employs his sons and he ex employs his uh, grandchildren. So he has a crew of maybe 20 people who work for him. Um, his nickname is El Abuelo, which means the grandfather. He's from Cholula, Mexico. And uh, 
And he never liked me. He, we never, ever got along. There was never any, um, any chemistry between us. But fortunately for me, uh, the guy is very vain. He loves to be photographed. And I, I can see that. I mean, he looks a little bit like a Mexican John Wayne, you know, kind of rugged face. Um, he has one eye that is a different color than the other. Um, so he tolerated me. I, I was able to work in his part of Willets Point, provided that I would always stop and, you know, take a picture of him, take a picture of his grandchildren. And whenever I saw him and I would go like, Abuelo, he would ignore me, like absolutely no contact, no interest. But if I went through his little corner of Willits Point and didn't stop to photograph his grandchildren, he would get in his van and come, <laughs> come <laughs> looking for me. Uh, so, yeah. Um, Colombian fishermen. You know, when, when the work is slow, they go fishing, literally. That's another view of the, of the ground and of um, the main street, Road to Nowhere. When you drive up to Willits Point, is the guy who meets you. It's like the gatekeeper, or one of them. It depends where exactly you enter, but there's always a guy like him. And so if you've been to the Middle East, it's a lot like that. It's a lot like a bazaar kind of experience. You drive in, somebody intercepts you, and they go like, what do you want? Come on in. <laughs> Let me show you something. I got that thing. If they don't have it, they know who does. And so they can always guide you. If you're looking for a rear view mirror for your 1984 Mazda, you know, and he doesn't have it nearby. He'll tell you who has it. And everything is numbered, and everything is uh, controlled. So, people are into their cars. This is a point of pride. Love the stereo system in the back. You better believe you can hear that. <laughs> all over Willits Point. Something that I like to do um, when, I, when I do a documentary project is I like to take notes. I like to have a notebook with me. Sometimes write down something that I hear, that somebody's saying. Um, Take down the names for sure. Write down, in this case, the names of the auto body shops where they work. Because it, it gets confusing. I mean, it's, it's a tiny little place. It's eight square blocks. But still, all the shops look like each other. And it's, it's a maze. So I, I took very careful notes. And uh, one of the things that I, that I like to do is I, whoever agrees to be photographed, I bring them back a photograph. Um, it's, it's the least I can do. I think it's up to every photographer to negotiate with the community, and it is a negotiation, what you're going to give and what will you get in return. Um, so there's many ways of giving back to the community. On, at the individual basis, I like to give them photographs, always. So I came back and I was looking for this guy, and I had his photograph with me. And I had his name. Whether it was real or not, that is a different question, because many of these guys are illegal. So you can't always you know, trust that if he says his name is Luis, it actually is Luis. Um, but I, I went to the shop. I looked for him. I didn't find him. I looked next door. I looked across the street. I went and did a turn. I couldn't find him anywhere. So finally, I came back to the place. And I asked the first guy that I saw if he had seen Luis. So he looked back at me, furious, and it was Luis. And I hadn't recognized him. And um, I was looking at this guy who looked older than the one in the photograph and who was um, very different in his 
energy in his body language. Uh, he, his mouth was very tight, very bitter. Um, he was uh, kind of hostile. And I, I was so overwhelmed by not having recognized him. But I, I think perhaps because of what he's doing in the picture, fixing a toy bike or the quality of the light, something in it conspired to make him almost feminine and soft. And I, I'd never had a chance of, of recognizing the guy. Uh, so, you know, I, I gave him the photograph and kind of moved on, apologized. Uh, there's many stories in Willits Point. This is a, a guy who works at a place called Brother Jesus Auto Body Shop. And when they're not working, he's always lecturing his mechanics slash students of life. Uh, he takes these young guys and tries to give them a, a structure, give them some kind of support and guidance. On the day that I visited, he was explaining the war in Iraq and why America had seen fit to spend billions and billions of dollars fighting that war. And he would draw charts on the back of the you know, the really dusty back of the, of the vehicles. He would draw charts and explain and point. That's a very interesting uh, kind of dynamic. I'm not sure you can see this projected, but every car is numbered. Everything is numbered in Willits Point, <coughs> which um, when, uh, when you're a photographer, you realize that every project has a certain kind of shape. And it is um, sort of your job to figure out what the shape of that project should be. How are you going to understand this body of work? What is the metaphor? What is um, its co coherent uh, logic? I found uh, that Willett's point was a vast array of parts. And like every catalog, it's also a poem. So just the accumulation, the enumeration of these things has a kind of poetic you know, momentum building. Um, and, and it's images like that that really um, bring that home for me. A lot of the people who come to Willits Point have uh, checkered lives, have difficult pasts. I, I met many guys who, um, who had their life stories tattooed on their backs. Uh, if you know something about ink, you could start piecing together you know, where they'd been, what happened to them. Um, it's telling. And they come, um, they come to Willits Point looking for redemption somehow. They're not trained mechanics. Nobody comes to Willits Point with a certificate in mechanics. They come there because they have no other place to go to. Uh, and I encountered the same thing um, in, in a previous project where I traveled with the circus in Guatemala for two years. It was the same kind of situation. It's a kind of revolving door. And people are coming in and going out, sometimes coming back later. But you never know who you encounter. And nobody even knows if they're good at the job or if they will be an asset or a danger. Uh, but part of the value of Willits Point is that, that it gives these guys a chance to earn a living uh, legally. And, and it turns around a lot of lives. Still life is another you know, aspect of this project. Families and their cars are very significant, the way people occupy their vehicles, what their car says about them and their station in life. 
what their aspirations maybe are, you know. Um, so I was also very interested in, in photographing families. This is a more symbolic moment. Um, as I mentioned before, I was, I was very, very interested in this enormous distance between the sky and the ground, and I didn't know how to combine them. I found this, and it, it was very powerful to me to see a cloud reflected in, in the mud, in the puddle of water, uh, the, the broken soccer ball, the barcode, all of these things um, kind of happened to come together in the image and, and help me bridge heaven and earth, uh, not to be overly dramatic, but that's what it felt like uh, to me that, that I finally managed to make it come together. Then, of course, I didn't know what the hell to do with the image because it was so different than the other ones. And I, I really, really liked it, but it was much more uh, symbolic and, and uh, lyrical than the rest of the work. Um, that's when editing sometimes, you know, gives you the solution. Uh, so the next picture in the edit is a photograph that is, is not that strong visually, but it, it combines very well, I think, with the soccer ball. And it's these jerseys, which are the absent team players, the absent team that is not there any long, longer, uh, which I always knew would be the case with Willits Point that it, it was uh, a place that was doomed. Um, so yeah, I, when you edit work, I think it's very important to remember that just like in sentences, the photographs are not only nouns and verbs. You know, you also need photographs that serve for punctuation or serve um, as modifiers. It's, it, you see it a lot in photojournalism. Um, where photojournalists try to make every picture very, very muscular, aggressive. Every picture has to be a showstopper. I think that's so boring. Um, so my philosophy of editing is, you know, you can turn it on, but you can't turn it on all the time. It's more important that, that you try to tell your story and, and do justice, not only to the form, uh, but also to people's lives. And, uh, and, what, and the emotion uh, of the place. Um, I'll talk a little bit about fundraising. <clears throat> I did a, a fundraising project on, on, on a different platform than Kickstarter. Uh, it's called USA Projects. At the time, it was brand new, and uh, they invited 50 artists to present projects. Um, I, had, I had never really thought of doing a fundraiser until they asked. And uh, I didn't really know too well what to expect. Um, but the way it's structured is that you get a page on a website. And uh, these are your basic materials. You have a project proposal. You have a fundraising goal and a <coughs> timetable. You have core re rewards for your donors and you need to do a, a fundraising video, which I had never done before. Um, so that's your basic setup. Um, I had a goal, it needed a minimum and a maximum, so I said to, um, to my audience that I would be shooting for a minimum of 8,500 as my goal, and a maximum of 15,000. And if I only arrived at 8,500, um, it would be a catalog. And if I was able to raise 15,000, then I would go for a book. So that was, uh, that was the strategy. Um, I had six weeks beginning December 1st, uh, 2010, and ending on my birthday, <laughs> January 15. It was a very nice birthday that year. And uh, I, at that point, already had almost, I guess, nine months of shooting done, which was perfect. 
um, I wanted to, uh, these are some of the rewards. So you see there's different tiers of support and then you reward people accordingly. But um, I already had some shooting done and I knew what I was doing and my strategy, my marketing strategy, because you have to think of this as a marketing project, was that I wanted it to be an ongoing body of work. I think it's very important if you're going to do a fundraiser that you keep your audience engaged. So there were other artists racing on USA projects at the same time than myself. Some people succeeded, some people didn't. One of the things that I noticed, because I was paying attention trying to learn the ropes, is that um, people who talked about wanting to do a project but hadn't taken the initial steps yet were in a very strange kind of conundrum because they didn't have anything to show week after week. It was still the same sort of, I'd like to do this someday, but nothing was happening. People had already uh, finished the work and just wanted to publish or present it we're also in a tough situation. Uh, so I decided to do something which I had never done, which is share my work publicly before it was finished. So every week I would post new images from Willits Point. And some of those images didn't make it into the book, but they served their purpose during the fundraising. And it was a, it was a very exciting sort of proposition for me, um, just because I didn't normally do it, and it gave me more freedom to just not wait until the picture was perfect, perfectly processed, but make it more real time and just hear people's feedback. So I did uh, updates on USA projects. I did direct mail. I did social media as a, as a way to get the word out. Um, I also contacted blogs with the good fortune that NPR picked up the story and then, you know, uh, thousands of people uh, were able to see it. And all of that translates into money when you're fundraising. I'd say if you're going to undertake a fundraiser, um, dedicate yourselves the whole entire time to that. It is absolutely consuming. It's all consuming. That's what you need to do for that month and a half or that month or however long you're going to do it is just raise money. Um, uh, my friend um, Zoe Strauss said that she would rather be stabbed in the face than ask for money. Get over it. You have to get over that. I, nobody likes to ask for money. But uh, the campaign was successful. I spent Christmas in the junkyards. This was my Christmas postcard. It was not easy because Christmas is the saddest day of the year in the junkyards. Why? Because people are pretending it's not Christmas. Everybody's working and they're not happy to be working. So therefore, you know, there's no reason to decorate or celebrate. Um, it's really, really depressing um, to be there for Christmas. And just when I was about ready to give up, I found this one shop, a uh, Mexican auto body shop that had an altar for the Virgin. And I shot this image, I sent it out, and that's when I reached my minimum goal. After releasing that image in time for Christmas, that's when I reached the goal. Um, not to be cynical, just <laughs> have to, you know, think of marketing. It's, uh, that's just how it is. Um, publishing a book. This is the cover for Yonqueros. So uh, I said in the beginning, I've, this is my fourth year at work. Uh, it took a year to shoot. It took about a year um, to start kind of structuring the work, organizing it, doing the fundraising. Um, I then applied for an opportunity uh, through Transatlantica Foto España, which is relevant for anybody here who is 
um, Latin American. Um, they have an annual call for applications. You submit your work. If you are um, accepted, then they fly you to one of two places in Latin America. They have two different places for a portfolio review. And you go for a week, and, um, and there's reviewers from Latin America and Spain and Portugal, and they look at your work. Um, I, I had a, a pretty bad, rough experience uh, with this, this whole thing because really I, uh, my work ethic is all New York. I live in New York. That's how, I, that's how I do my thing. And it's very, very different from the way it's done in Latin America. Uh, so people would open my portfolio and they would go like, ah, what a beautiful print. And then the next reaction would be like, it shouldn't be this way. You should not be photographing documentary work and using lavish photographic paper. Also, it should not look this way. It should not be so classic. And so, you know, I had a very, very unexpected reaction. I was just trying to understand uh, why or how, because in New York, there is no such thing. You go to a gallery and you always need to show the work the best way you can, you can show it. If you can afford a really nice frame, well, even better for you. If you do not print it correctly, no gallery wants to sell it. Everybody looks at craft in New York. It's very, very important here. And I, um, I spent, when I first graduated from school, I spent a lot of time printing for photographers. And I printed for um, Patrick de Marchelli, and I printed for Lois Greenfield, <coughs> Gilles Perez, Rosalind Solomon. Um, no exceptions there. Everybody was very, very exacting in what they wanted from their prints. They had to be perfect. Uh, luckily for me, the um, director of Photo España came to the Dominican Republic where this portfolio review happened. And portfolio reviews are strange because, well, it's a little bit like this presentation. You know, I've been working this for four years. I have an hour to tell you about it. It's very, it's very difficult to try and, and figure out what you want to say, how you want to convey it, how can you even begin to explain it um, in such a short amount of time. Well, uh, that gets multiplied when you have a 20-minute portfolio review. That gets very, very difficult. What happened is I did uh, eventually meet with the director of Photo España informally over coffee, and we talked for about an hour and a half. And she fell in love with the work. And um, that was the most important thing that could have happened. So she asked me if it would be OK to take it back to Madrid and show it to her uh, company, La Fabrica. La Fabrica is a publishing house like Aperture. And they also own Photo España, which is one of the largest photography festivals in Europe. So she took the work back to Spain. And the next step was I used the money I had raised as leverage, meaning um, I became an investor in my own book, which is what happens nowadays. Um, photographers are expected to come in with you know, part of the money needed to produce the project. Uh, this week, if, you, if you've been paying attention, um, to social media, uh, Richard Rinaldi has come out with a, a fundraiser on Kickstarter together with Aperture, the book publisher and the photographer. And I, uh, it's, it, if you're not familiar with his project, Touching Strangers, check it out. It is amazing. And I, I think in two or three days, he raised $28,000. His goal was 10000 <laughs> I don't know what he's going to do the next 45 days. Um, but uh, amazing, amazing success. Uh, but, but it's kind of, it's the way the business uh, works today. Um, I always thought of Junqueros as a black and white book. And um, a few days before Christmas, 2009, I don't know if you guys remember those tremendous blizzard that hit New York City. I made it out to Willits Point, but it took me hours. Oh, the train tracks were frozen. There, the, the, the service was really spotty. It felt like a polar expedition to get there that day. 
And when I got there, there were like three guys, and the rest was snow everywhere. Um, and it, it brought to mind, um, has anybody read A Hundred Years of Solitude? Garcia Marquez? Okay, at the end of the book, the last of the Buen Dias is sitting in a room struggling with a cipher text. He's trying to break the code. And he's reading, and he realizes, as he starts understanding the text, the death is right outside the door. And as he continues reading, it's his own destruction. So I thought that I would end my book with whited out landscapes, a little bit like the noise on the TV when your channel goes off. Um, and so, you know, that was fine, except there was another storm a few days later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so that gave it the lie, and so my concept was not true, it was not honest anymore. And I decided uh, that I would do something else. So I, I went out the day after the storm, um, early enough to, to be the first person in the snow. That's what I wanted to do, I wanted to wait for the sunrise. So I did, and I, I was lucky enough that, um, that it was a beautiful sunrise. And it played out uh, to be a, a very different ending, very hopeful, very tender, which is actually the way I feel about these Latin American guys. Uh, they're going to land on their feet. It's not going to be easy. And a lot of people are going to suffer. I mean, 300 businesses have to be shut down. and. Uh, Imagine the number of families and people who depend on them who, you know, won't be able to, to have this anymore. Because even if they relocate, you can't relocate 300 businesses anywhere in New York. That's just not going to happen. So they'll relocate piecemeal. Who knows who's going to go where and how they're going to do it. Uh, so this, this whole uh, kind of working class paradise <laughs> that is Willett's point, it can't, it can't be anymore. Um, but I'm hopeful for them. I, I think they'll be OK. Um, this next image, uh, just trying to give you a rough sense of the book design. This is chronologically, this is the last photograph that I took for the project. How do you know when a project is over? You don't. You never know. Uh, you really, you never, ever know for certain. But you have to. You have to stop <laughs> at some point. Uh, this is when I chose to stop. <coughs> Not because the photograph was so memorable. Uh, it was funny. I mean, I, uh, I was walking past these two guys, and uh, Mr. Softy was trying the little guy's ice cream, and the little guy was trying Mr. Softy, and they were having a conversation. And I, I thought it was kind of funny. So I, you know, I kind of stuck around and just listened in and, and Made a, made a few jokes about what they were doing. Um, and then Mr. Softy finished his ice cream first. And this funny thing happened. I don't know if it was because of the camera or just because of the architecture of the Softy truck in relation to the push cart, how much larger and imposing it is than the push cart. Uh, this guy started to preach to the other guy, which I, I thought was just you know, hilarious. For me, it was such a beautiful moment. Um, and the other guy is very meekly looking up at him, kind of, <laughs> uh, you know, just taking him really, really seriously. Uh, this is the last picture in the book. The reason why is um, that at that point, I already had an edit, roughly an edit of how the book was going to look. And I knew that it was going to end with the sunrise pictures. And this is a, the picture before the last in the book. So I felt, when I took that picture, I felt like something had come full circle. This idea of the seasons, which was very essential to my project, the changing of the seasons mm -hmm. and how the landscape is redefined by the, by the weather and how the work is affected, how their working lives are affected by the elements. Um, it comes full circle, right? Because uh, the black and white picture is about the middle point in the book. And if you're being attentive and if you're being careful uh, about seeing, you'll notice 
you'll notice that you, s you already encountered Mr. Softy once. And it's the only thing that, that repeats, that literally is the same truck, <coughs> except it's parked for the winter. Um, one of the best things about this book is that I was able to commission an essay from a writer that I absolutely admire, Francisco Goldman. Um, it, was, it, it was not easy, even though I know Francisco socially and even though there's a great overlap between us, he's, um, he's half Guatemalan. And uh, I've always admired him, especially for his political mind. Uh, he is really amazingly incisive. So I approached Francisco and this is um, the beginning of his essay. It was, it was actually very emotional for me to read this because I was coming back from Korea and as soon as I touched down, I did what everybody does, which is I turned on my iPhone and I, I saw an email from, from Paco, from Francisco. And my reading <laughs> during the airplane was uh, I, I had downloaded a a copy of Art, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World, and that's the book that Jurassic Park was based on. It had been ages since I read a book of science fiction by anybody. Um, I think the last time I read Conan Doyle I was probably 10. Um, but it was free, and I needed something to read on the airplane. <laughs> so I downloaded it, and so I finished the lost world, and this is what I encountered. And uh, Paco says, soon, maybe by the time you read this, Willits Point might be under the ocean. And then he goes on to compare it to the lost city of Atlantis. And um, I know that, that Paco waited, he waited, he waited until he write, had the right inspiration for the text, and I loved it. I absolutely loved that he made a mythical place out of Willits Point. He compares the mechanics to, uh, to the seamen and the whalers of Melville. Just amazing, just amazing. Um, my mother, my mother, my grandmother really had this expression in Spanish, uh, when you complete something, uh, you say, cerrar con broche de oro. And, and what it means literally is as if a woman has put together the perfect outfit and is then going to attach a brooch, a beautiful jewel that just closes everything together. That's how I felt uh, when I read Paco's essay. Um, I, of course, commissioned a translation because I did not want somebody in Madrid to translate into Castilian Spanish and turn everything on its head. You have to worry about the details. Latin Americans do not speak that way, so, uh, so I prefer to pay out of pocket for my own translation. And I, I, you know, I consulted, I found the right guy who did justice to the text. Um, I want to say the romance of the uh, author is gone, it's dead. Don't expect that. Don't expect to be paid big bucks uh, to go and publish a book. If you're Joseph Kudelka, expect that. But if you're not Joseph Kudelka, do not expect that. Particularly if it's your first monograph, um, which this is for me. You have a lot to prove. And every, every publisher will probably feel, and rightfully so, that they're taking a big chance on you. So uh, be prepared to enter into this agreement with money. You need to bring something to the table, and that's just the reality of it. It's, n it's not new, but it's more so these days. Um, <clears throat> I would say decide ahead of time where you're going to compromise and where you're not going to budge. It's not like self-publishing. If you're going to work with a mainstream publisher, they have a brand. Aperture looks like Aperture. La Fabrica looks like La Fabrica. Steidel looks like Steidel. They're not going to change everything they do for you. 
So that's maybe the hardest part for all of us who are photographers, right? We have an aesthetic, we have our concerns, we have a way of understanding the story we want to tell or um, parameters for a body of work. We have to be ready to compromise. I decided uh, well ahead of time that I was not going to compromise on the sequencing of the images, and I didn't. Um, each, each person has to decide where, where and when, you know, according to their, their integrity. Um, <clears throat> budget, time, and money to go to press. It is so, so important. Um, the book publisher is in Madrid. We went to press in Seoul. My wife um, is Korean. She speaks the language. I don't. So she came with me. We both worked on this together. Um, luckily for me, she's a wonderful photographer. She has really, really sharp eyes. So we got to press the crew on press. And this is also something to consider. You go there and there's six or seven guys who all work there and you're the only person who doesn't. So there's already, you know, an imbalance there. Um, I brought her along. They were very proud of the first signature that they showed us. And with some fanfare, they, uh, they allowed us to see it. Six hours later, I signed off on the first signature. I was not happy with it. I uh, could not understand how, having the match prints, they had not been able to match it. Um, so, yeah, it's rough. <laughs> I mean, people, people will tell you, they told us, you, you guys are the most demanding, impossible clients we've ever, ever had here. But we came all the way from New York, so, you know, what are you going to do? Match my print. That's your job. You have to also not be a jerk about it because I, uh, when I print on exhibition fiber, you know, that's not what I'm printing my book on. But so you have to understand, and this is where color management really, really helps. And thank you, Tom, <laughs> for making my life easier. I'm sorry, but um, I just had a question. You were talking about signature. What is that? I don't know what that okay. is. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, a signature is the way books are printed. So typically there's going to be maybe eight photographs on one signature, and it falls a certain way, and you know, then it becomes the book. But you don't print image by image, which makes it really, really hard um, to keep the control, the, the quality going. So every time you get a signature out of the press, you have to sign off on it, and then they print the 2,000 copies or whatever they're going to print of that particular signature. And it's called a signature because you initial it. Um, because I decided to make the book in color, my job was very hard on press. Um, I had to print black and white in four color which is, is beautiful. I mean, you get a tremendous quality. But any, any miscalculation, you have magenta spilling into it or cyan spilling into it. So for it to read as true black and white, you have to be very, very careful, really on the job when you're supervising. And of course, if you're printing color on the same signature, then <laughs> that, you know, you have to deal with color and black and white off each other, and that's almost impossible, but um, yeah, I decided to go with color and black and white. Um, it's been really exciting uh, to release the book. Uh, so far, I've presented this in Guatemala at La Fototeca, and um, at ICP here in New York. I'll never forget that. <laughs> That was, uh, that was quite a night, and uh, the display window at ICP had a copy of Yonqueros, and it had a copy of, um, of the newest Gary Winogrand book, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. You got to stop and savor certain moments. Um, enjoy the process. It's very important. Uh, the next thing that happened is 
I, I presented the book in Seoul, Korea, uh, in a solo exhibition at Ruga Hon Gallery, which was an amazing experience and um, certainly uh, beyond the scope of time that I have here to even begin to explain what it means to take the reality of Willits Point and transpose that into a gallery that looks like a Zen temple. I mean, uh, all, you know, like blonde wood and lots of light, a little rock garden in the front, uh, wild flowers growing on the tiles on top. I mean, really beautiful, beautiful, beautiful setting and so removed uh, from Willits Point. Um, the next stop on the tour is Mexico City in October, Gimnasio de Arte. I'll be teaching a three-day workshop as well. And there's a possibility of uh, an exhibition in Portugal, hasn't been finalized yet, and still working on an exhibition in New York. It has been shown in New York. It was shown as part of uh, Enfoco's um, uh, traveling exhibitions. But I'm looking at a, at, a, at a larger, more comprehensive exhibition. If it happens, if I get an OK this year, I will do it. If it doesn't happen this year, I don't want to do it anymore because there's other projects to be done. <laughs> so um, just a couple of thoughts here. Art is personal expression. We all know that. It is also uh, a way to examine and investigate, not only to express, but to learn, to deepen your understanding of the world and of yourself. Um, my projects are, as I said, rooted in my own identity. It takes different shapes. Some projects are more interested in culture. Some are more interested in politics. Some are purely personal. Um, I don't consider myself a, a documentary photographer per se. I've done different kinds of projects, sometimes collaboration, sometimes projects that are just self-referential. And that's OK. Uh, I would say within documentary work, I do the research diligently. But once I get to the place, I forget everything I learned and just trust that the camera will show me a different kind of truth, a visual truth. I'm more interested in lyrical truth than sociology. Let's put it that way. I, I am very, very interested in the power of images uh, to show us something that is beyond words. Um, I don't know how many projects each of us has to do, has within them, has uh, will have the opportunity, will life give me the opportunity to do two more, three more, five more, ten more? I'm not sure. But every project requires a considerable investment of time and energy and passion. Um, so choose them well. This is four years of my life, young kiddos. Um, how many projects do you have to do as a photographer? That's a question that I like to keep track of. Um, for the busy people in this room, which is every single New Yorker, don't give up on your artistic needs. Even if you have a full-time job, even if you have a family, uh, my advice to you is to be selfish, and practical and separate one day a week that is not up for grabs, that is non-negotiable. Do your thing one day a week and the work will build. If you can, you know, if you can do more than that, by all means. If you can be out there two or three times a week, wonderful. But if you do one day a week and you exclude everybody else's needs, and you have a, you're iron fisted and intransigent about it, the work will accumulate. It's very hard to do. But I did it while I was shooting, uh, only with the exception of trips that I needed to take outside of the US. I was in Willis Point week after week after week. 
Um, I talked about negotiating. It's very important that you are aware of the great gift that people give you when they let you into their lives. So give something back. Find a way of giving back. Um, I think always be honest. Do not falsely represent what you want from the project. They will find out later if you were truthful or not. So be truthful from the beginning. And if they're okay with it, then I think it's very solid. And people will be a lot more giving. Um, what is your interest and what kind of images are you going to make? Answer that to the best of your ability. That may change over time, but you know, be, be straightforward about it. <coughs> know your subject. Research is important. I take notes when I talk to people because my memory is horrible. <coughs> One of the reasons why I am a photographer is that I don't remember things unless I photograph them. Um, be generous and go deep. You know, don't stay at the surface. Don't be only concerned with whether the picture is successful aesthetically. You know, try to, uh, try to go deeper than that. So, um, thank you. I mean, when you were when you started shooting, I mean, when you go out to shoot, you have an open eye and you have the novelty of what you're seeing. As you go through the process and become more intimate, then it changes the way you see your environment, mm -hmm. and the story changes mm -hmm. from what your initial thought was to possibly finding another story. When you shot Young Corus, was that part of the process? Did you have one intent? and then another story developed along the way that was more compelling than what you eventually went in for? That's a really great question. Um, I would say along the way uh, you start creating some, some powerful images and so you build on those. Um, in poetry you have the idea of epiphany, a moment that is particularly uh, revealing, particularly um, intense or memorable in some way and when that translates photographically you you know you start sort of recognizing that there's certain kinds of images to be made um, in this place what is it about how am I going to approach this photographically so initially um, I, um, I was very interested in like, uh, like I mentioned before in the FSA photographers um, and what they had done in the 30s. And I tried to find my own approach to black and white, which would be both in dialogue and its own. So looking at those photographs and at America then, trying to find uh, an answer formally for that. What, how would I take photographs that were in dialogue with that era and yet were not of the 1930s and what did that mean? So um, I think in the, in the same way that you would write chapters in a book, uh, you start uh, coming up with cer certain themes or ideas that are important and, and the work grows from there. The, the biggest departure and I think the biggest difficulty was when I decided to incorporate color and I was doing the book design I was like, how do I do this? because I want to end with the sunrise, but I can't have a book in black and white and then jump to color for the last five pages. You know, that's, that's impossible. So how, how do I negotiate that? And that, that was one of the sort of difficult places where I didn't know exactly how the story would, would be impacted by, by the color work. I don't know if that answers. Hi, Jaime. Hey. Um, I wanted to know, uh, first of all, 
how were you introduced to Willis Point first? Mm. You know, how did you get the idea of Willis Point? And once you arrive at that idea, did your um, purpose change over time of what you were trying to reveal or portray in the uh, photos? Uh, well, Willits Point um, has been in the news, not in a front page kind of way, but, um, but definitely in the news. And um, I, am, I am interested in places like that where, you know, let's say Latin American mechanics uh, work in the shadow of the, of the sports palace. You know, it, it just fires up my imagination. Um, I, I heard about this on the news. I also um, came across a, a, a great movie called Chop Shop. I don't know if you guys have, have ever seen it. I, it's, a, it's a great movie. It uh, uses uh, actors from the community and it's set in Willits Point. It's fictional. Um, and I saw it and I was like, wow, that, how come I, I've never been to Willits Point? And, you know, what is there? And I forgot about it for a little while. And, uh, one day, I woke up and I, you know, I thought this is a good day to go to Willits Point, and I did. I took the train. I took the seven train out. I got there, and the sounds of Spanish were everywhere. And um, like I said, you know, the the place is very surreal. And so I I took my camera. I didn't really shoot people the first day. I mostly talk to them to have a sense of how they would see me or if I would be welcome there or what we had in common. I mean, yes, we're all Latin Americans, but do I have more in common with them because they're Latin American? Or do I have more in common with my colleagues in academia? You know, what does it mean? Yeah, Latin American, what does that mean? Uh, how far can I take that and how far do I want to take it? Um, as I mentioned, I, my previous project was traveling with the circus. I felt right at home. These were the same kind of guys. I love people who play by their own rules. It's, um, it's something that I'm fascinated by, how uh, a community you know, finds a way to, to be in the world that is so different from everybody else. It's something that, that comes back in my work, uh, often in a hidden way often not above ground, kind of underground, or a little bit out of sight. Um, so, yeah, so I, I shot some pictures, and I came back home, and I looked at them, and I was like, yeah, there's enough here to go back another time. And before you knew it, uh, yeah, I was, I was really sold on the idea. And that's how it all started. Hi. Uh, given what you just said and how personal a project it became, are you finished with Willits Point? In other words, will you go back later when the people are actually displaced and the bulldozers come in? Will you want to document that and keep that either for an epilogue or just for a personal um, work? Um, I may or may not. I don't know the answer to that. Um, photographers. I think are nomadic. <laughs> uh, so we set up camp, we become very involved, and then when the time comes, we're somewhere else. Um, at least uh, um, that's certainly been the case with me. Although today, uh, the, uh, Tarzan Lopez, the, the lion tamer from the circus, wrote me an email today. And my brother is um, the godfather of one of the trapeze artists. So I, n never say never. I, I, I don't know what my involvement will be. Um, as I said, um, my, I'm really not an activist. I, uh, I'm not picketing. I'm not um, chaining myself to the bulldozers or any of that. I, I'm, I'm very, very passionate, very interested, and absolutely on the side of the mechanics on this. Um, but I, I was interested in exploring what Willits Point meant as it was. And I, I think I, I did that. What happens to it, um, 
as a renovated neighborhood. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I will be there to document that. Yeah. <clears throat> I have one. Um, when you documented uh, your story and you wanted to see it in black and white, did you f photograph it with a digital camera? Yeah, it's all digital. Uh huh. Okay, so then you, you had to literally tr convert all your digital images mm -hmm. into black and white. Sure. So what I did is um, um, created a droplet. It's called in Photoshop, so you can automate a series of uh, operations, and then you can export a uh, droplet to your desktop, and then you can just drag your raw image and drop it in there, and it'll come out as a layered TIFF. And so I, I created my own black and white conversion. And I, I don't remember, maybe five or six steps that I wanted automated. And then I could go back and change the opacity of the layer or, you know, fine tune it. But it was a, it was a very efficient way of giving things a style. So I, I worked hard uh, to create the style. And once I created it, I automated it uh, so that it was consistent. I, I think. Part of uh, why that matters to me is that I've, I've always felt that good artists uh, think of themselves as authors. So you want your, your body of work to be consistent within itself. You want to establish a kind of recognizable aesthetic and, uh, and make images function coherently. Thank you, Jaime, right, well, for being here and for on this warm night. Thank you so much.